We're going to spend some time now talking about the, the, the upcoming science program for the B from them New Zealand genetics. Um, uh, while the government funding runs out in 2018, um, the board uh, anticipates B from them genetics to exist well into the future. So um, let's see how we go there. Michael, Michael Lee um, well, was born up the road in Omaru, educated in Otago University, worked in plant breeding in Sweden for about 10 years, health economics in London, uh, and in the University of, of, of Otago for a few years, worked with um, animal genetics for Pfizer Animal Health, and more recently has worked for Ag Research. He enjoys running a small farm and a forest. So um, Michael is going to talk about our sheep program. Okay, so, so basically I'll just give you a quick update on what the BLG program comprises in terms of the research aims that are more from a scientific perspective. But it is a very broad overview, but there's a lot of posters in that down in later sessions, so you'll be able to actually talk personally to a lot of the scientists that are, in, that are going to be responsible for the work. But one of the main focuses for the sheep work in BLG is to focus on looking at ewe profitability, especially in the context of hill country uh, farming. So I'm in, here's just a simple graph looking at, in the 1990s, the proportion of ewes that were either in hill country, a high country, or uh, low country sites. So basically the proportions are changing. Probably what's happening is, is that the number of ewes is decreasing, but they're tending to decrease on low country sites probably because of dairy, dairy pace basically taking over that land. But the numbers are, are, are about pretty stable in the uh, hill country <coughs> sites and that. So that's where a lot of the ewes are staying at the moment. <coughs> so the, the research really does focus on those ewes and increasing their product to, uh, profitability long term. So in a nutshell, I've taken the main themes of the research program and just tried to summarise them. So over here we've got genomics, which there's a new genetic evaluation system, so basically rebuild SIL. Um, there's, there's, it's, SIL's done a really good job in the last 10, 15 years, but it, it does need some attention. So there's a, a total rebuild of it planned. There's uh, phenotyping. In particular, we're we are looking at uh, feed efficiency as a trait to see, you know, is it worth developing? Um, there's also a bunch of work that will be done on looking at electronic devices to see if we can better record animals more cost effectively. We want to get stability and body condition score re routinely recorded as traits in SIL. And there's a an exp series of experiments looking at fit to environment. And so, but basically, these ex this work will, will end up in getting more accurate and, and unbiased EBVs. So that is really what we're aiming to do. So all, all this stuff, what it'll mean for you is more accurate and relevant EBVs. And then there's a whole lot of socio-economic research planned as well. And uh, Abacus Bio will be largely doing a lot of that. And it's to... to look at tools to optimise use of genetic information and also to encourage uptake and, and better use of that information. Because as, as uh, Graham pointed out, you know, we can do all this research, but if it's actually not used by you guys and industry, then the whole thing's pointless. So I see this, the whole BLG programme is more of a collaboration with breeders and with, inevitably with commercial farmers in the long term. So it's not about a bunch of scientists working in isolation, getting stuff done. It's about a collaboration with industry as well. And inevitably, all we're, we are all aiming for more profitable animals, in particular hills, uh, hill use in the hill country in this. So you know, a simple equation to remember is that your, your response to selection is in, uh, dependent on your selection and intensity and accuracy of your breeding va uh, value and usable variance, which is basically <coughs> your heritability. 
So I tend to keep that in the back of my mind when I'm working on stuff because that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase these components here so we actually get more better response to selection. Okay, so I'll just give a quick overview of the uh, topics. Uh, so the genomics and next generation evaluation system. So we'll continue to invest in genomics. Basically, there's a 600K chip available now, John alluded to, um, but also it's quite cost effective now to fully sequence a, a whole genome. So you can do that probably for a, a thousand, a, th a couple of thousand dollars at the moment. So 10 years ago, no, no one would have thought that you know, we could just take a sheep genome and s sequence it. Um, and it would cost you a couple of thousand or maybe even a thousand dollars at this stage. So the price will probably keep trending down. And the aim is to basically use that technology and ensure that we use it in, in animal breeding and in particular sheep and beef breeding in this case. So for the next gen genetic evaluation, what we want to do is we want to move to a big, large evaluation. And I think Mark will um, later on talk about that. But we don't want all these little bitsy uh, evaluations where people are trying to compare inappropriately between evaluations. We probably want to move to one, one big evaluation and, and get so that the information is used uh, as optimally as possible. And in that regard, we want to fully integrate the DNA analysis into that genetic evaluation system as well. Inevitably, that'll give you better EBVs, more accurate ones, less bias, and it'll also pass that information on to progeny and uh, relatives as well, which, is, which we don't do at the moment for the DNA evaluations. And I believe it's a necessary upgrade for SIL. I think you know, we've reached the, the top at the moment in terms of animal numbers. Uh, we can push through the system. So it's, it's been, you know, I think, about 15 years since it's been you looked at, and we re really do need to do that. Okay, genetic evaluation. So basically what you get now is a, the uh, SIL part of it, which is the phenotypes uh, and the EBVs here, but we do the genomic ones separately. We, we take phenotypes, we take fe uh, sheep 50K data on those animals, and we produce MBVs, and we combine them to GBVs. But in the future, you'll get your five, five or 15K SNP data. They'll get pushed into one system where all the information from sequencing, um, high-density SNP chip information, all the pedigree data and that will all get used in, in one infrastructure to give you your GBV. So we want that to be as seamless as possible and it'll use the information, I, I believe, in a, in a much better way. Uh, G by E, so basically we're looking at fit to environment. A lot of people are saying, oh, you know, the, the, the uh, rams bred on a low country site, they don't probably perform as well on, on a hill country site. So basically we're looking at fit to environment. We're asking the question, can we get a, uh, away with breeding a ram that fits all environments, so, or do we actually need to specifically breed for environments? And there's, there's, there's some evidence in the literature that for some traits that we probably do need to breed specifically for an environment. And so but we really do need to work, get, get information to actually substantiate that and maybe do some economics and, and, and work out a good strategy for that. But we do need underlying scientific information to, back, to, to give support to that. So G, when I say G by E, if you look at the... That, that graph there, we've got RAM A, B, and C. So and RAM A and B, basically if you evaluate them in your selection environment, which is your stud, the rankings won't change in the commercial environment. So if you take them to the hill country, the rankings stay the same. Probably there's no G by E. But if you take the RAM and you compare, say, RAM B to RAM C, you, you, you take... and Basically, RAM C becomes better in the commercial environment. This, it's probably indicative of a G by E interaction. And, and I guess you know, if you think of it in, in, as an extreme case, if you take a RAM from Southland that's never seen 
uh, facial eczema, you take him up to the North Island and suddenly there's, you know, he's, he's uh, exposed to facial eczema, then you know, that, that, that's probably an extreme form of uh, GYE. But you know, we're focusing more on the hill country versus low country and f commercial versus stud as well. So we're also looking at, in, in this respect, uh, it, ramping up the hills. There's two hill, C, hill CPT so, sites, so there'll be a comparison of basically size on hill and low country site. But you know, that, that's going to be an experiment that's going to take a long time to generate data. So we're also, uh, d we've also designed a DNA-based experiment that uses commercial farm data as well. And hopefully that'll be able to give us the information a lot quicker, but it'll also provide a mechanism to prove uh, size on commercial farms. Okay, phenotyping, we need to investigate feed efficiency. I think you know, in the UK they're talking about it and in Australia they're talking about it. So we probably do need to look at that. We plan to get an infrastructure to measure, the, measure feed efficiency, but we need to generate our data so we can build a, a SIL module if needed to actually uh, evaluate it in, in genetic evaluations. But Combined with that, we'll, we'll also look at the economics around that once we get the data and that, and actually work out, is it actually uh, cost effective? Is it worthwhile breeding for feed efficiency as well? So there's also more trait development, stability in particular, and body condition score, which we'll implement into SIL. And I think that's me. Um, but as I say, that's just a brief overview of some of the key projects and a lot of it will be covered in posters uh, later on. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> yes. How are you going to evaluate the feed efficiency? Okay, so, so, okay, so basically you've, you have an EID and there's systems around commercially and basically it detects how much the sheep, you know, so they go to a feed bin and it reads the EID, it weighs the feed before and after, so th there's, there's systems in place. So currently at, near Inbermay, we've got a site where we're actually uh, building an infrastructure around that. So if you talk to Trisha Johnston, who's sitting right behind you, I think, she can give you a, a good update on, on feed efficiency and how it's going to be measured. Uh, Michael, are you happy with the combination of uh, a, lot of, a lot of sheep now have a combination of different breeds in them? Okay, composites are, versus pure are, breed. Yes, are you happy with the, the work being done from one extreme to the other to find your DNA markers? Are they going to be accurate enough when we go into uh, a composite evaluation? Is the so, DNA going to be there for... So, so we're already evaluating composites. Yes, I know. Um, so, but traditionally, I think we, we've tended to be focused on highly Romney-influenced breeds, but I think... As we're getting more and more data from Texels and that, we will... So one of the aims is to actually get a set of predictions for a terminal sire, a heavily influenced Texel. So I, I'm confident that if we keep going, we'll get there. And, but it is a collaboration with you guys measuring and us um, trying to get extract that information out of the data. So... You know, it depends on what we get as well. <laughs>